Okay, and welcome to week nine, folks. And this week we are talking, uh, continuing to talk about animation. And I wanted to make sure that we uh, did justice to uh, one particularly important aspect of animation uh, that can really take your uh, project to the next level. And that is the inclusion of 2D animation into a 3D project. And uh, this, it sounds like a mouthful, but it's actually, it's actually very useful. Uh, also, I want to emphasize the correct workflow uh, that I want you to follow for making animations. Uh, because there are some things about that that are really important. Okay, so I'm going to go over this relatively quickly. This isn't going to be a very long lecture. Uh, most of it's going to be demonstration. Uh, but essentially, the animation workflow, uh, <laughs> workflow the persistence of vision and uh, image sequences. So an image sequence, now it's important that you understand uh, what that is. Essentially, if you have an image sequence, it's something like, something like this a collection of still images, which you can see there. Now, the still images in themselves aren't moving, but if you do something like this, I'll try to do that again, you can see that they form a movie. And so, you know, why am I telling you that? That's right. Yeah, you can get the idea. Why am I telling you that? Well, I'm telling you that because uh, that in itself uh, is a kind of animation uh, and the computer handles this in amazing ways. And so I'm going to show you how you can take still images, even in the process, even that in the process of you know, not doing videos and make videos out of them and also turn videos into still, still images and back and forth. OK, so going back to what we we're talking about, make sure we're still on, uh, still images can bring two dimensional animation into the 3D world. Uh, anywhere that an image can be mapped can include animation. And so uh, your surfaces, we've shown you how to use uh, image maps on surfaces. There's no reason why you can't animate those. I'm going to show you a demonstration of how that can be done. Uh, images can move from videos, uh, can come from videos or other animations. Uh, anything, any, any way that you can find the frames, you can use them. And if you can't find the frames, you can make the frame. And generally, uh, they can be created in Adobe Premiere. Now, this is an important relationship here. Uh, one of the reasons why you're in this class and not just learning this online uh, is because I'm trying to put 3D graphics into a larger context. So let's say that you're in the world of Lightwave. Now, there are people that, that do only this. There are people that have this luxury of using only one program. So someone's a, a, a graphics creator they're sitting there looking at Lightwave, and that's all they know. And somehow uh, somebody asks them to do an animation or something like that. They export whatever this is out to wherever it's going, and they never see it again. Uh, well, uh, in, in the, most of you are not going to have that luxury. You're basically going to be working within a context where somebody needs something that's a completed product. And so uh, you've got Lightwave, and over here you've got Adobe Premiere and they can talk to each other. See, that's the important thing. That's the wonderful thing about uh, computer software is that it's no longer in different rooms in the same building. You know, let's say, and I actually saw this, you know, back when I was interning in a video production house, you know, there was a graphic shop upstairs somewhere and we almost never saw those people. They were upstairs. And so they would be creating pictures and then somebody would say, okay, send that down and so they would literally plug a cable into the wall and then they would record whatever image they were sending it onto a video machine. And that was a very big video machine. And they would record it on tape and then that tape would become part of the project. And if it was an animation, they would have to record the animation and then that became on tape. And then the graphics people never had to work on it again. Once they'd exported it, it was done. And uh, the, the people editing were always mad at them, at the people upstairs, and the people upstairs were probably always mad at the people downstairs. And so, because they really weren't speaking the same language. Now we are. And so now, instead of having to convert artwork from one format to another, basically we can have this synergy that really works. And so, uh, basically to make a long story short, if Premiere is over here, Premiere can take video and turn it into still frames, a still frame sequence, which 
can be accepted into LightWave. LightWave can produce a still frame sequence that can be converted into video over here and vice versa. They, they have this relationship that actually works and you don't have to leave the room. It's the same computer. You just have to run a different program and different programs are designed to do different things. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, that they can't interact with each other. And you can control every aspect of the image. Uh, in anything that, what you can't do in Lightwave, you can do in Premiere. That's another way of looking at it and vice versa. And if you're well-versed enough in both of those programs, uh, there's amazing things that you can do. Image sequences do not require codec or compression. Now that's an important thing. It's going to come up again later. But understand this. If you have a series of still frames, that series of still frames is always going to be useful as a series of still frames. Now that sounds like a dumb thing to say, uh, but what I mean there is that if you convert that into an image sequence, and if you convert that image sequence into a video, the video automatically includes compression because then you're trying to compress it not just into frames per second and, uh, and, and so forth. You're trying to compress that into a greater file that a computer will be able to open up and stream right away. And so you're making it also something that you could send across the internet uh, as a streaming situation. The moment you do that, you automatically put in a lot of compression. And if it isn't done right, or if it's done twice, you begin to lose quality. And so uh, remember, digital information never has to lose quality, but that doesn't mean it can't. And so uh, always work with the most pure form you have, and an image sequence uh, is, is the ticket for that. Okay, when you export still frames, uh, it may sound silly, but it works. And so the first thing you might think, is, because I showed you in the last week's uh, video, that you can make a simple animation and tell uh, Lightwave you know, to go ahead and send it out as an AVI file. You know, an AVI is a very common Windows file. Uh, Macintosh doesn't necessarily like it, but they will read it. And uh, typically an AVI file either has no compression at all, or it has very bad compression. Well, that's not really fair to say. There's different types of codecs that will produce AVI files. Typically an AVI file is not going to be very compressed. An MPEG will be. MPEGs are much more useful to you as video files. And so the thing is, coming out of Lightwave, you don't even necessarily have the option to do an MPEG file. And if you do, uh, you may not have a great selection of codecs. And so, essentially, uh, the worst thing you can do is export a bad video, a video that doesn't really have a lot of, a lot of uh, redeeming qualities, and then leave Lightwave and never come back. So what you want to do instead is produce something from Lightwave which is the very best light wave can do, and then do your compression later. So you can always go back to the originals. And if you need to change the originals, just, and, and just export a different set of frames. So that's why we're doing this. It's much better to export your finished animations as still frames than as videos in light wave, because then you can take your finished product into Premiere and do that last step. It may be the only thing you do in Premiere, or it could be you have other things to do in Premiere. That's another question altogether. Lightwave, again, has very limited codecs. Still frames have no compression. We've already talked about that, and that's why we do this. Now, Adobe Premiere can do great compression, meaning that uh, if you're in Premiere, uh, and this isn't, I'm asking you to use one particular codec that, that works better, uh, but your client may have something else in mind. So in Premiere, one of the things that, that they do have that is um, pretty much undeniable. They've got every codec that you've ever heard of and many that you've never heard of before, and never will. And so if the client wants some off-brand codec, chances are it's in there somewhere. And so render the frames from Lightwave, import the frames into Premiere, which we'll demonstrate, and then export the finished video from Premiere into H.264 at 1920 by, 20, by 1080. Now that's, that's for this class. Now, if, uh, if your client asks for something else, they will give you any details they need you to have, and then that's what you do in Premiere. Don't do that in Lightwave. Okay, now here we are in Lightwave layout. And what you're seeing here is a very complicated model, a very complicated animation. 
And I want to take you through this because it's important to understand the context. Now, if I go out to the perspective, I, you can see that I literally have a room here. This is the, uh, uh, the room that the audience is in. And so you can see there's a lot of stuff going on there. If I change to one of the cameras, you'll see I have two cameras uh, that I can use, uh, one of which is basically like a security camera. This is, just shows me the room. Now, the other camera that comes up is uh, called the VR camera, and that camera allows you to see something else. Just do whatever I did. That camera allows you to see something else. I'll show you what I'm talking about. If I go to virtual progressive render, I get this. Now, basically what this is, is a 360 viewpoint. You got the front of the room here. These are the sides of the room. This is the back of the room. And so uh, that's, that's virtual reality. We're gonna get into later. But right now, uh, I'm only gonna concentrate on the uh, security camera because this is all, all that you're gonna need to see for this. And this is virtual progressive render. Now I want to give you an idea of how you can make stuff like this because it's rather interesting. So this is a room, an ordinary looking room. Now, as you move the pointer, and it's a, it's a complicated animation, a lot of stuff happens, but you'll notice a couple of things. The ceiling gets yellower, the walls get darker, and the carpet gets dirtier. All kinds of things happen. So immediately the room kind of degenerates into this bubbly mass of darkness and chaos. So you can see at this point, the ceiling is starting to come in and uh, the, the walls become darker. You know, the TV image is showing static, this uh, green static, which I may change. And the floor is even sinking. You know, all kinds of nutty things are happening. You know, this is supposed to be like a haunted house, that sort of thing. And so I wanted to show you how I did one of those effects because you might find it useful. And it's, it's so easy to do that I'm surprised it isn't more common. Okay, so first of all, uh, let's, let's look at how we would do any of this. If I go to my surface editor here, and pull my surface editor where we can see it, and um, there's um, basically the room is called Jello House because it, it kind of does that Jello thing. Now, if I look at any of the walls, let's say front wall, uh, you'll see it has that wood panel texture. And if you go over to the little texture box here, you can see that it's loaded up with an image called wall sequence. Wall sequence. Now, there's an important thing that you have to understand. This is a sequence of images uh, which creates an effect. Now, I'm going to show you where that was made. If I go over here to Premiere, this is Adobe Premiere. Adobe Premiere is a video editing program. And so this timeline uh, shows a still image. Now, where did I get the still image? Well, that's easy enough to show you. And it basically started here in a folder called Textures. Now, this is where I have all of the textures. That's the carpet that's on the floor, and that's the wall. Now, here's a second wall. Now, here's an important thing. If you look at this, you see that uh, that wall, that piece of paneling, is 500 pixels by 500 pixels. Now, the important thing to understand is that that is not a television aspect ratio. Television is never one by one, or at least it never has been before, but it can be, because now we're talking about a very different world. And so, if I go into Premiere, put that aside here, uh, I can create a timeline that is one by one. And so the way I would do that is if I would go to File, New Sequence within Premiere. So if I were to go to Settings, you can see those are some of the presets I can choose. I can also scroll all the way up here and go to Custom. There, instead of 1920 by 1080, I can choose any number that I want by any other number that I want. So I can literally create a movie that has an aspect ratio that wouldn't make sense anywhere else. And here, I've established a timeline that is square. 
And all it is is two images. So if you look here, uh, there is one image on top of the other with a crossfade. This is the tele this is the uh, the playback. As I move the pointer, you see that gradually that image changes from the good one to the burned out one. And that's how that works. And then all I had to do was export that as still frames. So uh, the first thing I did, by the way, the reason I chose this timeline, I, I matched it to the image so that I wouldn't have to change anything else because originally it was just a still image. Then if I do File, Export, Media, then I get this. I chose the PNG format, PNG sequence, and it's going to match the source. So it's basically going to make a sequence of still frames that are all uh, like that. And I just give it a name. And what the result of that was, was this. If I go to wall two, I have all of those still frames there. Wall 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And as you scroll down, you can see that they sort of begin to turn black or whatever that color is. And that gives you this. Now, I produced 310 of them because I didn't need any more than that. And also... I could have just produced it up to here and stopped because you can set the thing to stop as soon as it hits the end of the frame and not go back to the beginning. But that's how I did that. And the result of that was this sequence, which allowed me to have the room basically dissolve into chaos. And that included everything from the upholstery and the chairs, which went from this nice, beautiful green uh, pluff material to this uh, kind of moth-eaten look. You, know, you can see the carpet gets all bad. The lights and the ceiling you know, get all yellowed like they're years, years old. And, uh, and the whole thing with the eyeballs, you know, that's a whole other thing altogether. Uh, but this is what actually happens. And eventually it just, it just gets worse. Okay, so that's, that was for this particular project. And uh, you can export this in the, in, in the basic 360 video, which allows you to basically experiencing it from the inside. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to demonstrate is how you could uh, apply these in a slightly different way, and probably something uh, more common that you might do. Now, what I have here is an actual video uh, that was uh, created uh, for this purpose. And basically, if you look here, we have somebody delivering a speech. And it doesn't really matter what she is saying, but she's delivering a speech. And right now I'm going to pretend that this is news footage. Let's say that, that she is delivering some kind of a, uh, she's an anchor person for a news show. And all we want to do is take this video, which is a legitimate video. This could play on any television set. And we want to basically use that video uh, in an animation that we haven't even created yet. So from Premiere, all we would do is do File, Export, Media. And from there, uh, you see that we get the, the export session. And here, if we leave it on H.264, that will give you the 1920 by 1080. This is basically uh, high definition television. If I were to select something else, like PNG, for example, I could, I could send that out as a PNG sequence, which is exactly what I would do. And that would come out 1920 by 1080. And it would produce an awful lot of still images. And, in, and as a matter of fact, I've already done that. And as you can see, if I uh, let this catch up with itself, it's got a grand total of 1,581 or 1,582 images. Those are all still images, you know, going from the wide shot to the close-up shot. And so there's very little you could do with this in itself uh, unless you wanted to, to capture the perfect still frame uh, of the, 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 the scene involved. But that's not what we're doing. What we're going to do is we're going to bring that into uh, the, the program, the LightWave program, and do something with it. So let's start out with a blank slate. Here we are in Modeler. And so what I wanted to do 
is to create something to put that on, just to show you the, the possibilities here. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna create nothing but a simple box, just to show you, and, and I'll even do it slightly differently because we're gonna be looking at this head on. So I actually wanna make this look like a television set. So I'm gonna approximate the appropriate aspect ratio, but I'm gonna give it some thickness as well. Now, another thing I'm gonna do I'll try to center that. Another thing I'm going to do with this is I'm going to create some possibilities for tampering, let's say. If I hit the N key and get my numeric pad, I'm going to create, well, first of all, even though I don't, well, let's, let's create a radius. Let's put, let's put a, a nice smooth edge on that. Not that we really have to because it won't really matter. Uh, but let's say we also want to do this. We want to create some, a little bit of mesh. Now we don't have to create mesh here, but let's, uh, let's leave this available. And so there we go, there's our television set. And we're gonna do a couple of things here. Now, first of all, that's gonna be, uh, probably shouldn't have done the uh, corner. Let's get rid of the corner because I'm gonna show you we don't need that. And so this is only gonna be the screen and it doesn't matter that it has any, any thickness or not. In fact, we could even get rid of that, but let's, let's leave it kind of like that. Let's give it something else here. Let's, let's call, we'll make another box and it'll be the same type of box. And this one will be we could create a bevel Now that will be our decorative area. And um, I'm going to have the screen kind of bulge outward just to save a little time. It normally would bulge inward, but let's, let's just go ahead and do it this way. And so uh, this can be our television set. And so what we're going to do here, I'm going to turn off box, and I'm going to go into polygon mod mode. And I'm basically going to go here and select all of those. And I'm going to change that surface and, and call it uh, frame because we may want to use that as a frame. We don't have to though. And so I'm going to go to this one and this one, I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I'm only going to grab the front surface. Oops, the wrong place. I want to be here. I'm only going to grab the front surface. And um, can mix the side there. And I am then going to call that uh, screen. Let's say screen. And so that will actually give us three surfaces. It'll give us the screen, the default surface, and the frame surface. I'm going to save this. I'm going to call this uh, screen. So that will include both layers. Then if I go over here to layout and I load this, load object, and I'll go load the screen, and let's see what we get. So right now, it isn't all that interesting. If I go to my perspective view, let's see what I can see. You can see the edge. You can see there's the screen, there's the frame, and that actually works. So what I can do right away is go into my surface editor, and I can go to the, uh, the, the frame surface. So I choose the frame surface. I could give it a texture, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go ahead and give it kind of a gray finish like that. And I will give it some specularity so that the lights recognize it. And I can even demonstrate that. So some specularity, not a lot of glossiness. We want to have that be kind of a, a, a dull surface. Uh, it doesn't have to have any reflection. Uh, and that's about it. We don't even need to apply smoothing or anything like that. And so that gives us the frame. So then let's go for the screen. Now this is where it gets interesting. 
So if I go here to my surface, I'm going to leave it planar because it's a two-dimensional surface. Now, right now, I'm going to load an image. And this is where it gets fun. Ooh, isn't that crazy? So I'm going to go here to that series of frames. I'm just going to grab the first one and open it and see what it does. And I notice it will take that, uh, that image and it will tile it like wallpaper. Now, if you had a reason to do that, great. But if you don't, just hit automatic sizing and it will conform it. And so now, believe it or not, that's all you do, almost. The only difference is this. If I were to take my pointer here and start moving this ahead, the image never changes. That's because right now the program doesn't know that that's what I want to do. Because it thinks that I'm just, I mean, it should ask me, but it doesn't. It thinks I've just chosen to make that image on the screen the whole time. And so, if I want to go there, if I want to fix it, I have to go to Image Editor, which is this other, other um, dialog box. And there, I've only got one image in there. And where it says Image Type is Still, I can just switch that over to Sequence, and then suddenly everybody's happy. And that's literally all I have to do in that uh, program. So then, as I scroll through this, and right now there's very few frames here, but you can see that it will, it will cover what was going on there. So we have a television set that is now playing. And so then, once we've established that texture, uh, normally television sets give off light so it's okay to give it some luminosity. You could also give it some specularity so that the screen surface responds to light and maybe a little bit more glossiness. And that's what you would have to do. And for this, we can apply some smoothing. It's, uh, if you get close enough to the surface, you might, you might see something there. But here's where I want to actually have some fun because I want this to work. Now, first of all, I want to demonstrate something that we may not actually do. Uh, but I set it up, so I'm going to demonstrate it. And we'll, we'll stay in perspective view, but I'll just get a little closer here so we can see, and we can put this anywhere. So our anchor person is talking. Now, if I go over to here, here is, uh, and see the, the image loads. What I want to do is show you what, with, what we can do with this. If I go to modify, and I go to bend, and I grab the edge of this, I can wrap this like I'm wrapping it around a can. And if I go here, oops, look what we did. So you can see that the video will play like that. And just to make it more interesting, if I go here and I rotate this, And let's say I bring it forward. So you can see what you can do with this. And it's all there. In fact, let me make sure we can see the whole thing because if I put the frame in, in preview, I'm just going to rotate that. And I'm going to play fast and loose with this because we're just playing around. So if we go here, you can see the entire video is now playing on the can. And you can, you can see most of that pretty well. You could also do something else. So you go here and uh, select, I'll just turn off. Let's say I select those polygons and I hit move and I just pull some of those out. Let's see what that would do. See, I can cause a bulge to occur in the screen. So I can literally change the shape of the screen. And if I'm on the surface editor, I can even turn on a smoothing is on, but you can see how it, how it smooths some of that out. And so you can do some amazing things. Now let's, uh, let's pretend that we don't really want to do that because that's not really what we're after at this time. But remember, you know, that could be like a television set playing on a glass or a bottle. 
you could have a label that's telling you about the product if you want to do something like minority report. And so then if I go back here and just hit control Z a few times, and so let's get it back to the beginning. And if we're here again, you know, then there we are. And so there's our, our beautiful television set. And so we'll be serious from here on in. And what I want to do is I want to make this into a quick logo for a television news program. So let's say, and we'll go out here into texture mode and uh, we'll look at the camera view. So the camera view is seeing this. And what I want to have happen is I want the, the television screen to kind of fly into the room and do a dance. You know, because that's relatively easy to do. It may be a little annoying, you know, but let's, uh, let's have a little fun. So if I go over to that little bitty button there, which I wish they made more easy to see, I'm going to select both layers of this to make sure I've got it all. And so what I want to do is I want to take my, um, I'll take my pointer all the way to the beginning. I'll go back into perspective view. So you can see where the camera is. So at the beginning, I want that way back there and I can even apply some rotation to it. So I can rotate it so that maybe it does a pinwheel like that, let's say. And if I bring this up to 50, then I can move it in. And if I were then to look at the camera view, and so I want to do my rotation. So I should have done the rotation back at the other end, but I can frame it this way as well. So this is what it would do. How about that? You can have it so that it kind of flies in and does its little thing here. So if I line the pointer up with that keyframe, I can also apply this rotation as well. And which if this were back in the 90s, that would be really nice, but it's not. So this is uh, largely just uh, for demonstration. I could even uh, give it one more rotation. So let's say I just do this once and let's see what that looks like. Okay, so now we've got this whole thing kind of flying in, uh, which admittedly would be very annoying. But we can also do one other thing since we're doing this. If we go here back to Modeler for a second and we uh, turn off Move and clear all this stuff, we could apply something to the back of the frame. So if we're looking at the screen there, I can basically go here real quick and just type logo. And uh, for my logo, I can type um, Baxter News. And I can create, I can use any font I want there. Let's find one that's, that's going to be easy enough to work with. Let's try Forte, see what that looks like. So if I put Forte in, Baxter News, I can live with that if it can live with me. And uh, I put it in the wrong place, but we'll, we'll do that anyway. So I selected the polygons in the logo and I got rid of all the others. And so I'm just going to modify and move this back. Now I'm willing to bet that if I do that, it's going to create a little bit of a problem. And so if I go here, let's see if we can see what that problem is. And this is actually pretty interesting. So if you look at this, I'm pretty sure Baxter News is backwards. 
but also Baxter News has the wrong surface. But if I wanted to, to do better, first of all, let's, let's just have a little bit more fun before we give up on this. I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to go to size. I'm going to make that a whole lot bigger. And then I'm going to move it so that it's, it's impossible to ignore. And let's see if we can get a better look at it. Right now it's upside down. But you can, you can make that part of the magic. And you can give it a different surface and have it do something. And that can be part of what you're doing. And then, of course, you can go back here. And uh, I'm just going to edit co uh, copy. I'm just going to make another layer here and paste that in. And this time, I'm going to grab the, uh, the front of this. And I'm going to make a new surface. I'm going to call this face. And uh, the rest of it can be what it is. But if I bring this here, first of all, I wonder if it's, uh, it's even in the view there. Yeah, it is. So it's a second part of the element. So when this finishes its thing, if I go to perspective, I want to move that where it's visible. So I'm going to hit move, bring this up, bring this over. So camera view sees this. Okay. So that's getting a little better. So maybe that's where we want this to end. It's an 80 frame logo. And so if that's going to work, we want to sort of bring this over here. Right now it looks stupid, but we'll do better. So if we look at this in VPR, and let's see what we can do for face, surface editor face. We'll go ahead, we won't bother with an image, but let's make it kind of a goldy color, and we'll give it some luminosity, some specularity, and some glossiness, and uh, maybe even some reflection. In fact, why don't we take the frame and Give that some reflection too. Let's see what that would do. So if we do that, let's see what we get. And this is without doing much. But uh, let's first of all just get back to news the heck out of there. So if I'm if I'm back here on perspective and I'm on texture shape, so we'll have this come in from the sky. So then if we're looking at our camera view, all of this happens and Baxter News comes flying in too. And maybe that's acceptable, maybe it isn't, but let's pretend it is. Okay, so the only other thing we need to do is to position the camera. So I'm going to take it to the, to the 80th frame, and I'm going to go to my camera position. Now right now, the camera has a keyframe. So what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to move the, I'm going to grab the keyframe, and I'm just going to drag it over here if I can do that. Because I don't really want to bother with a lot of camera moving. So the keyframe, we're going to keep the same, but we're just going to move the camera in. So I'm going to move the camera in, bring it down a little bit. And at this point, we need to establish format. So I'm going to go to the camera. Camera's lit up. Go to Properties. And I want that to be high definition, so 1920 by 1080. Now, when I do that, you'll see that it creates a slightly wider frame. And so... This is what we're going to see. Now, if we look at this 
in VPR, you can see we get some of our shadows and stuff. And we can leave all the rest of that stuff to its own devices, you know, in this particular case. So there's our, our logo comes in. And uh, if we're happy with that, then all we got to do is export it. And so the way we do that is we go to um, the render tab up here. And uh, this is where we get to, to make certain modifications. Because normally you just hit F9, etc., and do things. But here, when you're talking about animation, there's a few more options you want to look at. So if you go to Render Globals, which is a very dumb name for this thing, but Render Globals up there, uh, the, the first thing you want to look at is the General tab. You see it's got frame 1 to 120, which is okay, except I really only need it to 88. So I'm just going to put 90 there, because I don't really want to export more frames than I have to. And it's going to do them one at a time. And so if you wanted to make it go play faster, you might skip frames. That's one way you could do it. And so that's basically it for that. Under render, I'm just I'm not going to change anything here. In theory, you could do some things. You could uh, you could change the way the highlights are handled and stuff like that. We'll leave that alone. And uh, for your camera, uh, if you had more than one camera, you would select it there. We only have one. And it's 1920 by 1080, so that's fine. I'm not going to bother with lights because there's nothing in particular we're doing with lights that need to, needs to be checked there. But with output, here, instead of checking Save Animation, because I don't want to do that, I'm going to check Save RGB, which when I do that, it will immediately ask me to put the frame somewhere. Now, this is something that's a little bit critical. If you're going to do this, uh, and we're, we're going to put them in the class folder. If I were to just leave them right in there, it would make a horrible mess. Because what it would do is it would export 80 frames right into there. And I want to contain those. So I'm going to put them in a big bucket, which I am going to call frames. Now, right now, I really only need one bucket because I'm not going to have more than one version of this. And I'm going to call this TV logo. And I'm going to hit save. And so now we look at, at what it's going to do. And I can choose any number of different things here. I'm just going to make sure that I do um, PNG 32. PNG 32 in this case because I want to have the option of editing that black space if I want to later. So PNG 32, as it will create transparency there. And that's really it. Then... I just hit F10. Now, F10 is going to ask me, do I want to continue to frame 120? No, I don't. And I don't want to do whatever that is either. So now, it's going to start producing frames. Now, if you wanted to see this, if you go over to here, and uh, let me just find something real quick. And that would be week nine. You can literally see frames are going to be added to this. You can see what the frames are doing. They're, they're adding as we go along. So right now it's already produced 29 of them. So it's 38% uh, it's done. And one of the reasons why it's going so fast at this point is that there isn't very much rendering to do because the TV screen is a little bit further away. So it's now getting to the point where it's doing about one second per frame as it closes in. And that includes uh, everything to do with uh, uh, putting the, uh, the proper image in there. And see, it's slowing down a little bit now. It's taking about two seconds because it's got some surfaces to render and it's starting to take up a little more room than it was before. And so now we're at close to four seconds per frame. And so once it gets there, that's yeah, around three seconds. And that's where it's settled. And so now it's going to keep on going steady at three seconds per frame until it hits the rest of those. So it's, it's working on the last second now. And really, this is actually going pretty fast uh, by rendering standards. So you can see it's just coming in now with the uh, 
the logo. The logo is just basically dropping down. And it's not really changing the rendering effect by all that much. But as it brings it in, I see it's, it's rendering the shadows that the logo has as it drops down over the screen. And so now we're at close to four seconds per frame and that's probably where it will live. Okay, so now it's done. Okay, so now uh, there's nothing else you have to do in Lightwave because now if we look here, all of the frames are in place right up through 90. So then if I go to Premiere and I close off this for now, so at this point, what I want to do is I want to make a new sequence to put this in. So if I do File, New, Sequence, I'll get this. And here, I want it to be normal. So I want 1920 by 1080. So this is going to be a normal sequence. And I'm just going to call this TV, TV Logo. It's going to hit OK. And so that'll give me a nice empty sequence. So then I'm going to import and from week nine, wrong one. So through six, week nine, and there's our frames folder. I'm just gonna grab one, the very first one, and I'm gonna check the box that says image sequence. And so it will take that all as video and then it's, it's now in the project window. If I drag that into there, now it's, it's uh, giving me a warning saying that the sequence doesn't quite match the image settings. So I'm gonna change the sequence to match it. I'm not exactly sure what the problem was, but there it is. And so then there is my logo. So I'm just going to zoom in on that so you can see the whole thing. And if I drag it there and I just hit play, let's see what it does. So there is a nice smooth animation. And obviously if we were doing this for real, it would be a little longer than that. But it'll show you how you've incorporated a piece of video into the um, finished product. And then if we wanted to export that as a final version, all we would do is just move the uh, timeline to the beginning. And I'm just going to skip that by deleting the ripple so it takes it all the way to the beginning. In this case, I want to fade in on it. So under Video Transitions, I'm going to do a Cross Dissolve. I'm going to make a nice short Cross Dissolve. So it'll be something like that. And one other important thing, notice how it just ends very abruptly because it ran out of frames. I'm just gonna bring in the very last frame. So if I do another import, I'm still in the same directory. This time I'm gonna grab frame 90 and I'm not gonna bring it in as an image sequence. So frame 90 is a still image. And if I just, if I just grab that, and sometimes it gets into this weird mode. I'm going to grab that and just stick that there. So as I play it, it will stop there. And so if I feel that that's long enough, I can just move the out point in by that and then just dissolve it out. And that's probably good enough. So then what I would do is I would export this as a final video. So if I do File, Export, Media, and in this particular case, I'm going to go back to H.264. It's right there. And it's going to match the source, which takes us back to 1920 by 1080. And that's basically it. It's going to make it an MP4 file. So I'll put it right in week nine. I'll make sure it's the right one though. Let's say B306 and week nine. So I'm going to drop it right there. TV logo is fine. I hit save and it's short enough. I'm not even going to bother queuing and I'm just going to export it 
and you can see it's, it's going to blow through that pretty quickly. And then if I'm here, there it is. And so that's the finished product. If I double click on that, let's see what it does for me. It's playing the whole video and that's the finished product. And it'll keep on playing that over and over again. And that's basically, uh, it's not a very good TV logo. It's uh, in fact, it's horrible. Uh, but the, uh, the, the workflow is what I want you to concentrate on. And you can basically do this any way that you can imagine. And so that is how you can incorporate uh, still images into uh, animation and vice versa, and how you can export still images and turn them into a finished video.